All right, that's just the, I don't know if you mentioned, so the, the license thing, all this content is available under a Creative Commons license and is shared as mentioned on that GitHub site and also on rnabio.org. Um, and you're free to use it going forward and check back for updates. And you know, then we've had actually surprising number of people have decided to take the materials and teach their own course on this. So one day you may be so expert at this that you're teaching others and you're welcome to reuse this content if you find it useful for that purpose. Um, the purpose of this lecture is really just to, to get us on the same page. Get some work. Um, I guess, yeah, okay. That's right. Is that working? Yep. Okay, sweet. So we're, we're just going to quickly, I'll try to be to go through it relatively quickly, although I do encourage um, you to ask questions along the way. Uh, this is kind of the only lecture where we're going to talk about sort of the background of RNA biology and how RNA data gets generated. Um, you guys are all coming from like really diverse experimental systems. There's probably a lot of stuff that's common between us in terms of the way data gets generated, but this is a good time to, to raise anything, questions that you've always wondered about, sort of nuances of the way RNA-seq data gets generated and how that can influence downstream analysis and interpretation. So please do feel free to uh, interrupt with questions. Um, so we're going to talk through the just the overall structure of the course. Um, we're, we're kind of breaking into these four components, and but there's sort of a lot of modularity within those. We'll start with an introduction. Uh, we'll spend quite a, a lot of time going through um, sort of the reference genomes, reference transcriptome, uh, data file formats, the format of the raw sequence data, um, data QC, so the kinds of things you do at the beginning of an RNA-seq experiment um, when you first get your raw data, say, uh, and then a fair amount of time on alignment and then visualization of alignment, which also kind of doubles as a, sort of a course or sort of mini course on the integrative genomics viewer, uh, which is really useful for uh, transcriptome analysis uh, to just help you kind of interpret and visualize what's going on with your data. Probably the biggest section in terms of uh, just the amount of content and the complexity and the time it takes is expression and differential expression. So we're going to generate expression estimates in a few different uh, ways, uh, and then we're going to feed those into differential expression analyses also with several different approaches. Uh, and we're going to talk about things like batch correction and pathway analysis of the gene lists that result. Um, and then, as I mentioned at the end, we'll do an alignment-free expression estimation uh, section. Um, these all of the the bulk the vast majority of the time is going to be spent doing stuff at the command line. So there's relatively few lectures like this one. This will probably be the longest lecture. And then there's a few like mini lectures sprinkled in here where we kind of introduce the background concepts. But this course is really meant to be pretty hands on. So it's sort of uh, very applied. There's a lot of like theoretical math statistics stuff behind a lot of the tools that we're using. We're not going to dive super deep into that. We, we can refer you to like materials and lectures if you kind of want to go sort of deeper onto that side of things. But the the principal aim of this course is, is is kind of in as short a time as possible, try to get you comfortable running these tools, installing tools, working through a relatively complicated pipeline of bioinformatics tools from raw data to a result that could be, you know, interpretable in terms of a biological uh, experiment. Um, and so it, quite a lot of work over the years has, has gone into sort of refining the exercises to work like this in a, in a, in a real, like in an education setting. So this has required us to, to create data sets that are a little bit contrived, but uh, which is a, which is a downside because they're kind of not quite what you would get with a sort of a, a full size diverse data set. Um, but the trade-off is that it allows us to run through all of the commands exactly as you would run them on a, on a large data set in a in a short amount of time. So there should be like very few times where you're like launching a command and then waiting for the computer to like run for hours before the result comes back. Everything happens kind of in seconds or minutes at most. Um, but to achieve that, we did have to like kind of create things just so. Um, but basically everything that you see, you should be able to run exactly the same way on a full data set and then it just takes longer. Um, so it's really set up with that kind of in mind. Uh, and then there's this rnabio.org is a, sort of an online course that accompanies this course that you're taking in person. We're going to be walking through that step by step. And the idea of that course is to try to be a, like self-contained, self-explanatory, portable, something that, you know, you're going to like 
drink from the fire hose for the next three days. There are probably times it'll be like going, it seems like it going really fast and it's overwhelming, but that content is always there and you can always go back and re-review it. And there's a lot of commentary and, and written explanation that mirrors a lot of what we're saying out loud here. So the hope is that you'll be able to go back to that and be like, okay, now I remember what was going on here. Um, and if you find any like sections of that online content that are really like, sort of unclear or vague or feel like a black box, please do uh, let us know because we're always trying to improve it. Okay, so this is module one. We're going to really talk very briefly about the background of molecular, uh, the molecular biology of RNA sequencing. We'll talk about some challenges specific to RNA-seq, um, some general goals and themes of RNA-seq analysis workflow. So we're going to actually kind of run through several sort of parallel analysis workflows and Hopefully you'll start to see the kind of the theme of them. Um, some common technical questions related to RNA-seq analysis, and then I'll introduce the, the hands-on tutorial and we'll kind of get into the, the practical stuff from that point. So before I go any further, I think a lot of you are biologists already um, or have a strong biology background. There sound like there were a few people coming a little bit more from the computer science side and sort of moving into interesting biological questions, but I think it's really useful to, um, to start with a, a, a brief review of the, the central dogma, uh, which is what's depicted here. So this is a classic, so this is a cartoon that I created during my PhD, uh, one of millions that depict this, um, showing the, the flow in, of information from double-stranded genomic DNA template, um, which gets uh, transcribed in a five prime to three prime direction. And I'm depicting a kind of example gene here um, that in some species, a gene kind of might look like this, where you have three exons and two introns, and the introns are really small. But in most eukaryotes, the introns would be much bigger. They're shown kind of small here just for display purposes. Um, and then there's regulatory elements uh, that control the, the transcription of this thing. So you have a promoter region. Um, you have uh, a place where transcript is initiated, uh, and it goes to a certain point, and then it terminates, and there's polyadenylation site. Uh, and this results in a single-stranded pre-mRNA molecule. So now we've gone from DNA to RNA, where the introns are still in place. Um, we have a five prime cap uh, and our poly A tail on the three prime end. Uh, and then there's a sort of a second set of regulatory elements that govern how this thing gets spliced into a mature mRNA molecule. So we have donor splice sites and acceptor splice sites uh, and a, a branch site. Uh, and then we have other more subtle uh, uh, elements that may influence the, the splicing uh, of this uh, pre-mRNA in, in different tissue contexts, say, so exonic and intronic splicing enhancers and silencers. All of these things work together to control the behavior of the splicing machi machinery, which is a complex of proteins that come along uh, and remove the introns and splice together the exons uh, to give a mature mRNA molecule, uh, which is capped and polyadenylated, and now our exons are right together. Uh, and this thing contains our open reading frame, uh, so a start codon and a stop codon uh, that governs how it gets translated uh, into protein. Uh, so the protein is depicted here in a, in a linear fashion with an N-terminus and a C-terminus, uh, but of course that's not what proteins really look like. They, uh, they ultimately wind up being uh, uh, folded uh, and then often have uh, sometimes numerous post-translational modifications layered on top. Um, and all this to say that, so for many of us, we're, we're here to take a, an RNA-C course or, or single cell RNA-C course to study what genes are doing and on a sort of very basic fundamental level. Um, for many of us, um, we're actually interested in protein coding genes, the proteins that make up the cell that have some impact on the, the phenotype or function that we're interested in. If there was a high throughput way to somehow just take pictures of these proteins and see what they were and quantify their abundance in a high throughput, cost-effective, easy to interpret way, probably many of us would do that. Um, there's still, you know, some people are interested in non-coding RNAs. And so in that case, you would have to directly interrogate the RNA sequences. But a lot of, a lot of research is at the end of the day focused on protein coding sequences. But the technology really hasn't emerged. There, there are prote there's a whole field of proteomics, um, and it, it is gradually improving. Uh, but to this day, there isn't really a cost-effective way to just get like a snapshot of like, this is every protein that's being expressed. These are the relative abundances of them uh, to really accurately determine their, their identities and quantities. Um, so in many cases, that's why we're doing RNA sequencing as a proxy to uh, quantifying proteins. 
Uh, and we, you know, probably many of us have heard that that is not like a perfect way to do it. There are sometimes discrepancies between what's happening at the RNA level and what's happening at the protein level, um, but it's incredibly useful thing to be able to do. Uh, and it has other advantages uh, for people that are studying, as I mentioned, uh, genomes that are from species that are less well studied. RNA-seq has really revolutionized the ability to take a, a new species for which we don't have good gene predictions. We don't know where the genes and exons and neutrons are. Um, at, and we used to spend, there used to be a whole field of bioinformatics focused on just looking at the DNA sequence, sequence uh, and trying to anticipate what the genes were, what, where the exons and introns were just by looking at the DNA sequence. But now because we can shotgun sequence RNA, sequ RNA molecules and then just align them back to a reference genome and get like a view of what is actually happening, it has really like revolutionized that field. Um, what is actually the subject of an RNA-seq experiment here, though? Which, which thing, what, what thing that we're showing on this slide is, is the closest to what we're actually sequencing in an RNA-seq experiment? There's sort of, there's, so there's like five, there's five things being shown here. Which, which one do you think is, yeah, the mature mRNA is probably like the closest. Um, and then there's, you know, there's a bunch of nuances in the way libraries are being made, but uh, really what we're doing is, is taking these molecules, converting them to cDNA, and then sequencing those. Um, but how else are, is what we're doing in an RNA-seq different from what's being depicted here? Any other? So say we're, we're sequencing this, but is this really what we're sequencing? Yeah. It's cDNA and set instead, yeah. What about the size of it? It's smaller, yeah, smaller, right? So we we fragment or break into pieces cDNA. So in your species, the median gene length or transcript length could be two or three thousand bases. Uh, and if we could just sequence those things directly, again, efficiently and cheaply, that would be nice because breaking them into fragments creates sort of another complexity to interpretation that now we're not sequencing full length transcripts. We're sequencing pretty small pieces of them, really. Um, and then we have to kind of think about how those relate back to the full length transcript sequences. Um, in recent years, there has been quite a lot of advancement in long read RNA sequencing. So hopefully in a few years, this course will become like redundant in this form and we'll have to actually, re I would love to be remaking this course to use purely long read RNA data from like either PacBio or Oxford Nanopore or maybe another one. Um, but it, it just seems that the, the long read sequencing technology, as amazing as it is, and as much it, as it continues to advance, it's advancing very iteratively. So every year we hear like long read sequencing, like that's high throughput and cheap is sort of just around the corner. And it's been just around the corner for a while. Like I, I first read about nanopore sequencing in a Scientific American article in high school um, in the uh, 80s, uh, 80s, 90s kind of thing. Uh, so, and we're here we are. Um, like 20, 30 years later, still like tweaking these pores, trying to like feed molecules through them and get an accurate readout. Um, but we're, we're actually getting pretty close. So it could actually be that in a couple of years, there'll be like a big shift where we'll transition a lot of this type of analysis um, to uh, long read sequencing platforms. But right now it's still pretty hard to compete with the cost effectiveness and throughput of Illumina's short read sequencing. You can generate an RNA-seq library and very, very comprehensively sequence the molecules in that cDNA library for a pretty affordable cost. And to achieve the, the same level of sensitivity and depth on a nanopore sequencing platform is still very, very expensive. You have to sort of run a, Pro a Promethean like multiple times to, to get the, the equivalent of a single bulk RNA-seq experiment done on Illumina. Yes. Yeah, so I, I guess I was kind of oversimplifying a little bit. So this molecule here is it's kind of the closest to what we're sequencing, but then there's a bunch of nuances because there there are different library construction approaches that um, either enrich for the the mRNA molecules by priming off of the poly A tail or decide not to do that and uh, because they are interested in RNAs that are both polyadenylated and non-polyadenylated. And there's there's other reasons to do it too. Uh, and I'll I'm gonna I have a slide that kind of talks through some of those like differences in library construction approach. 
Um, so this is a really like simplified overview of what an RNA sequencing experiment looks like, and it kind of mirrors a little bit what we're going to do in our uh, our hands-on exercises uh, that we'll walk you through, and then also stuff that you'll work on on your own. You start with some samples of interest, tissue, cells that you culture, that you isolate from a growing organism that apparently uh, that you can obtain from, uh, was there someone who said they were doing like ancient RNA? So I assume that's not from a living thing. Um, that's amazing. Um, so you get a sample from somewhere um, and you isolate RNA from it uh, and you try to isolate RNA in, in such a way as you get an RNA that is as high quality and as intact as possible and your mileage may vary depending on the source of your RNA. Um, and then you generate cDNA from it, as was mentioned, fragment, select the size, so sometimes size select, some, some people do size selection, some people don't, but you wind up with like a range of sizes that are say 200 to 400 nucleotides long. Uh, and then you create a library by adding Illumina linkers to either end of these fragments. Uh, and then you flow those fragments, sorry, across a, a, an Illumina flow cell um, and use that for this massively parallel uh, sequencing uh, approach. And what you get back are these uh, fragments that are often depicted like this. You'll see many different tools and figures and whatnot that depict an RNA-seq or other NGS sequencing read like this as kind of two little boxes connected by a line um, where, in this case, the dark blue and the dark red pieces are the, the adapters that were used to on the ends of this, the cDNA sequence that initiate the sequencing reaction. And then you sequence often from both ends towards the center and if the fragment is small enough relative to how long your reads are, the reads might join each other in the middle. Um, and if the fragment is a little bit bigger and your read lengths are a little bit shorter, there might be a part in the middle of the fragment that you didn't quite sequence. So sometimes that's called the, the insert um, or the, I guess, the unsequenced portion. Uh, and you get a range of these situations. So some of your reads are, you know, basically the two reads overlap completely. Some they don't overlap at all. Some they overlap just a little bit. Um, and the analysis tries to take all that into account. Uh, and then the, the analysis really involves taking all of these sequenced fragments, aligning both ends to a reference genome, uh, and then feeding those alignments into a, a, quite a variety of downstream analyses for different purposes. There are some challenges to the general challenges to this process. So, um, you know, there's in any biological experiment, you have challenges associated with the samples and how those are obtained. In some contexts, you may have purity considerations. So that's important here because we're talking about bulk sequencing and maybe the cells that you're interested in don't represent all of the cells in your sample. And so that complicates your analysis and interpretation. Uh, maybe you're working with a system where it's hard to obtain a large quantity of RNA. This is not super common, but does happen. And then quality RNA is kind of famously like uh, fragile. Um, so it, it can be degraded relatively easily. And so there's a lot of like concern about uh, RNA being degraded and whether that can influence um, your analysis and interpretation. Um, and this is one of the areas where the, the short read fragment sequencing actually works out in our favor uh, because we're expecting to short sequence these short reads anyways. It's actually not a problem really if our RNA is, is degraded a little bit because we're gonna break it into pieces anyways. Um, but it can become a problem when the RNA gets so degraded that the pieces are smaller and smaller and smaller. And once they get really small, that can, that can create a problem. And of course the degradation may not be random, it could be biased. Um, so that can be a problem. Uh, and when you're doing experiments comparing conditions uh, or perturbations, if you have some kind of systematic bias, like all of your tumor samples are really degraded and all of your healthy normal comparison samples are really like intact, uh, that can create like sort of batch effects. So things like that can can introduce complexities. Um, the nature of the molecules we're sequencing. So as I showed on the central dogma figure, the the RNAs we're sequencing here um, that we're actually trying to profile consist of small exons that before being spliced were separated by large introns. Um, but now we're sequencing the part the the mature mRNA where the exons are spliced together. Uh, but then we're usually going to align those sequences back against a reference genome where you have exons and introns, and that creates a mapping challenge. So that, that, that's a much harder alignment algorithm problem than DNA sequencing and alignment back to a reference genome. Um, and it can create some like sort of complexities uh, in the analysis. Uh, another thing that's you know quite different from say DNA analysis is the, 
the relative abundance of RNAs varies widely. And this is one of the, the reasons why bulk RNA sequencing on the, say, the Illumina platform remains so popular um, because of the amount of data you can get for a relatively low cost. You can overcome the problem that there's this huge range in the expected abundance of different RNA molecules just based on their function. There are some RNAs that are functional. Uh, telomerase is an example I like to use. So telomerase is a very, very important uh, protein. Uh, it helps to maintain the ends of chromosomes. It does that with only a few copies per cell. It's, it's very, very sparse. We don't need a ton of this protein around. Uh, and when you measure its expression level, it, you need a fairly sensitive technology to measure it in, in many systems. Uh, and bulk RNA-seq works great for that. Other RNAs that are in the same sample, their normal expression, they're part of the, the machinery of the, the engine of the cell or they are part of the structural components of the cell. They might be present in tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of copies or more per cell. And we're just sequencing randomly. So we just get what we get. And we always have this problem in RNA-seq analysis that you're essentially like randomly sampling reads from a pool and you just tend to get a lot of copies of the things that are abundant. And when you're interested in many genes that are not the most highly abundant genes in the cell or transcripts in the cell, um, you have to sequence more deeply to kind of get past all of this really abundant stuff. And this is you know, not a problem that you have in the other types of sequencing experiments. Um, and this is, yeah, this is due to things like ribosomal and mitochondrial genes that are just very, very highly expressed. Um, RNAs all, also come in a wide range of sizes. Um, so the that can influence interpretation as well. So to some degree, when you're uh, estimating the abundance of something, you have to account for the fact that if it's a really, really large thing, you'll sample it more easily than you'll sample a really small thing, all other things being equal. Uh, and then for really, really small RNAs, the just the way the libraries are constructed, you tend to lose really small molecules with your sort of typical bulk RNA-seq uh, library preparation strategy. And so I think someone mentioned small RNA um, research. Um, that would require, like, um, the analysis we're going to do would require probably some tweaks to, to work for a small RNA, although many of the concepts would be the same. Uh, and then I already mentioned that RNA is really fragile. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Agilent assay? Is this something that's still widely used or something similar, some kind of electrophorogram? You, you run your RNA essentially on a gel, but through a capillary, uh, and then you get a readout that looks something like this. You get spikes over time. The smallest molecules come through the capillary first. The larger molecules take longer, just like on a gel. And then you read out abundance from a fluor as the RNA molecules go past a detector, and you get peaks or spikes of uh, detection. Um, and in a really intact RNA molecule, this is from human in this example, uh, when you have total RNA that's not degraded at all, what you see generally is two peaks that correspond to the size of the ribosomal RNAs in that species. And each species has kind of a characteristic pattern. And based on the sort of height and proportion and uh, cleanliness of these peaks, uh, these tools like the, the Agilent assay will uh, give you a score of, of intactness or integrity, a score of 10 on this system is perfect intactness of so the RNA is thought to be not degraded at all. Uh, but then if the RNA is degraded uh, and it starts to be broken into smaller pieces, you see something more like on the left here where you still see those two ribosomal peaks here, but you also see a lot of other smaller peaks where the RNAs have been broken into smaller pieces. Uh, and I provide a link here as a reference uh, to a series of uh, these um, uh, runs of this instrument with RNAs isolated from sort of different circumstances, everything from cell line sample where the cells were growing and happy one second and the next second they were in triazol and RNA being isolated and the RNA that comes out of that is super intact to an FFP block that's been sitting in a shelf for 10 years. Uh, and then we scraped off some like dust and tried to isolate RNA from that and every, and a bunch of examples in between. Um, just turned out that during my PhD, I worked on all these different projects where I sort of experienced that full range from like really great to really terrible. Uh, and so I provide a bunch of examples like to, just as reference points so you can kind of like visually compare. This is another reference slide. I will really talk through this. This is actually really old now. So when RNA sequencing first started, um, some sort of big consortium efforts launched, like we're gonna use this amazing technology to you know study the transcriptome in some systematic way across a bunch of uh, different like uh, thematically connected perturbations or different cell types and so forth. Uh, and some of these consortia said, well, we're starting this big initiative. Let's like step back and say, 
We'll write, we'll write some guidelines. We'll assemble a team of experts. We'll talk this through and we'll decide sort of what are the characteristics of an ideal RNA-seq experiment? What kinds of things should you think about when you're planning to prepare for the analysis? How should you generate your data? What kinds of controls should you use? And so forth. Uh, and I link to these, these documents here with this link. Uh, and, you know, they're like 10 years old now, but it's really fundamental like stuff. So I think it's still um, useful to, to review the ideas that they cover. Um, before starting a, a new RNA-seq experiment. How many people already have RNA-seq data like in their hands that they're waiting to analyze or starting to analyze already? Okay. And then maybe some others that are like, it's like on the horizon, there's a plan to, to do some RNA sequencing like in the next six months or a year or something. Yeah. Okay. So a few more. Okay. Yeah. So for some of you, it might make sense to like kind of take a look at some of these um, documents that talk about sort of RNA-seq experimental design. Uh, so I mentioned it was mentioned earlier this the distinction about sequencing mRNA molecules versus non polyadenylated molecules. That is one of several sort of tweaks to the way that RNA seq data gets generated. Um, and I would say to this day there still remains quite a lot of diversity across different sort of sequencing centers or cores. I'm guessing many of you like isolate RNA or send tissues or RNA to some kind of service that generates the RNA seq data for you. And they may have like a menu of choices, like they do it two or three ways, still pretty common. And that those two or three choices may differ between like the core at this university and the core at the university in the next province over, uh, or even within your same university, there might be different people doing it different ways. And these are kind of the major examples of where the variation is. So one of the things that you continue to say, still see is that they'll offer an option or they just prefer to do a poly A selection of the RNA before the sequencing. Um, and that's a really important distinction, whether that's being done or not. And if it is being done, um, it means it's more important that your RNA be really intact because you're going to be priming off the end, the poly A end of all of your RNA molecules. And if your RNA is degraded, that means you might be missing the, all of the five prime ends past the point where all the breaks happen. So you can wind up with data that's like quite biased towards the three prime end of your transcripts. Um, and then of course you're you're not getting the non polyadenylated RNAs, some of which may be of, of interest to you. Um, but the advantage is that it really enriches for the sort of coding transcripts. And it means that if you are interested primarily in polyadenylated species, you kind of get more bang for your buck. You get sort of deeper sequencing of those molecules um, with less total amount of data generated. Pretty much every um, RNA-seq experiment involves riboreduction, so some kind of attempt to get rid of the hugely abundant ribosomal RNA molecules that are in most uh, of your species um, that in most cases are like really dominate. So they, in human people will say like 95 to 98% of all the RNA molecules correspond to the ribosomal species. So you can't just sequence the total RNA or that's all you would be sequencing is these few ribosomal species. So you need some strategy that gets rid of them. And I'll talk through the sort of competing strategies that people use for that in a couple of slides. Uh, size selection, it's quite a lot of variability in how size selection is done and also how fragmentation is done. Some people do the fragmentation on the RNA. Some people do it uh, on the cDNA. Some people will not do fragmentation if they expect the sample might already be fragmented. Some people try to do it uniformly. There's enzymatic approaches. There's um, sonication approaches. Uh, and then you might decide to do um, uh, size selection after the fact or tolerate kind of a, a broader range of sizes. And that can depend a little bit on just the way your core operates. Um, they might be combining your RNA-seq data generation with a lot of other experiments, some of which are not RNA-based. In that case, that might be problematic for them to have some libraries with a much wider distribution of fragments than what they're typically seeing from, say, their DNA or attack seq or all the other things that they're doing. Um, for people that are working with really small samples, there are some amplification strategies that are still pretty widely used uh, that involve uh, linear amplification. Um, there still remains to quite a lot of variety in whether your uh, library uh, construction retains the strand information or not. Um, so this gives you kind of a qualitative difference in the output where you get your sequence reads. And in some libraries, you can't tell which strand was being tra transcribed. You can infer it by the way it aligns to the gene. And it's like, oh, it aligned perfectly to this gene inside of this exon. And I know that that gene is transcribed in this direction. So it's probably from that gene and it probably came from that strand. 
Um, or if it aligns across an exon intron boundary, you can say, well, there's only one way that that really makes sense because I have an exon intron boundary. Um, but there are library construction strategies where the, the strand information is explicitly maintained so that where right in the sequence information itself, you can say like this came from this strand. And that allows you to, to, to sort of disambiguate areas where there's actually transcription happening in both directions at the same position. So in some species, you'll have genes that are arranged on top of each other, at least at the ends, and you'll have like parts that overlap and you could have reads that align in that chunk where if you didn't have the strand information, you couldn't be sure which of actually which direction transcription was happening uh, because you're ultimately sequencing uh, double stranded cDNA in that in that instance. Um, exome capture is one of the ways that some people enrich for um, sequences that uh, correspond to mature or known transcripts. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and then library normalization. There are some um, molecular biology approaches other than riboreduction that are sometimes used to try to account for the differences in the abundance between really highly expressed stuff and really lowly expressed stuff. So, so there are a few strategies that people do on top of the riboreduction to try to get rid of really, really abundant species, say, in their particular type of tissue. Uh, and all of these things, um, I, I don't recommend or not recommend any of them because they really are done depending on the what's needed in your experimental system. Um, the main thing to keep in mind is just that if these things are varying between the samples that you're hoping to analyze in your experiment, to be really like aware of the possibility of batch effects. So if you have, you know, some of your libraries are created, created with poly A selection and some of them were not, and you're hoping to do a differential expression analysis, you definitely have a potential batch effect that you need to try to account for. Okay, so just to walk through a little bit more of the the molecular biology here. Here's like a really cartoon depiction of what the generation of data looks like, starting with uh, tissue at the top. So you have you have some source of tissue uh, that you take a chunk of uh, and you isolate total RNA from it. Uh, and then there's sort of a, a usually like a point where you do send some of the sample down, down a side path for a QC check. Um, and it, I'm depicting a uh, gel electrophoresis. I don't think many people actually do this. They used to do this, like actually take some of their RNA and run it on a gel and, and visually look at it and see sort of the abundance and the quality of the RNA. More common is to use some kind of quantitative like gel electrophoresis type assay, like I talked about here, where we are looking for a particular pattern of fragment sizes to assess quality. Uh, so we do this and we, we decide that our RNA uh, looks like we have enough RNA and it's of sufficient quality that we're going to make a library from it. Uh, and so we go back through this, this kind of workflow where we'll DNA's treatment, do a DNA's treatment. So that's to get rid of genomic DNA. It's not 100% perfect, but it will get rid of the bulk of genomic DNA that's still in your sample um, because every piece of DNA there is going to come through uh, and potentially be sequenceable. Um, once you convert to your RNA to cDNA, there's not really a way for the technology to distinguish whether a fragment came from genomic DNA or cDNA. Uh, so the, the next step is to do cDNA synthesis. So all of your RNAs get converted uh, to cDNA. And then it may have already been fragmented or you might fragment uh, at this point. Doesn't really matter. Um, just however your core likes to do their fragmentation. And then there may be a size selection uh, where they just pick out like a range of sizes. Uh, and at this point, uh, there's usually some kind of at least basic cleanup that gets really rid of, rid of really small stuff or an explicit size selection that gets rid, rid of small stuff. So at this point, you're probably losing small RNAs and RNAs that are particularly fragile um, or maybe some RNAs that form like certain secondary structures. Uh, but the hope is that this is pretty much an unbiased sampling of the transcriptome minus really small RNAs. Um, so a pretty holistic view of the transcriptome. Then you add your sequencing adapters to the end of each fragment uh, and feed them into a sequencing experiment. So at this point here, um, there is uh, usually a relatively near the beginning um, or, well, it can be done at different steps, but uh, at some point during this workflow, there's, a, there's the enrichment step. Uh, and the three kind of like most popular enrichment strategies are depicted here. Uh, so in the, the top left, I'm depicting something that's not enriched at all. So this is imagining just the total RNA where you basically would just be sequencing ribosomal RNAs like crazy and not getting a ton of useful information out of your RNA-seq. Uh, nobody does that. They pretty much all do one of these three uh, options depicted to the right here. Um, and I would say 
probably the most popular overall is the ribosomal RNA reduction. So this is where you're selecting for um, ribosomal RNA. So you're basically using a series of probes that uh, hybridize to ribosomal RNA molecules. You're holding on to those, and then you're washing everything else through, and it's the LU8 that's basically the RNA molecules that you care about. Um, and sometimes you might do that twice, or you might do it once, check how well it worked, and then do it again. Um, and then the competing approach to that is sort of flipping the selection the other way, which is the poly A selection approach, where now you're holding on to with a hybrid capture the molecules that you do care about, and you're washing through all the ribosomal RNAs, and you're keeping uh, the stuff that was on the column. Uh, and then a third approach is to do a cDNA capture, where instead of um, capturing uh, the poly A tail, which uh, sort of biases you towards polyadenylated species, you're directly capturing with an exome reagent, which is basically hybridizing to every known exon that was designed on your exome reagent, holding onto those things and washing everything else through. And sometimes actually a combination of these things will be done. Like you might do ribosomal RNA reduction and then do a cDNA capture. The cDNA capture is really great if you're if you're really interested in coding transcripts that are already known transcripts and your species already has one of these designs available and it's pretty easy to do this capture and then you just in really enrich for the, the RNA molecules that you care about and it surprisingly doesn't introduce much bias in terms of their abundance like the things that are more abundant they come through and they're still by far more abundant the things that are not as abundant still come through there as being not as abundant. It does like bring the low stuff up a little bit and bring the high stuff down a bit. So it sort of compresses the range of expression values, which is also kind of an advantage. So it sort of uh, you spend a bit more money prepping your library, but then you, uh, you're able to sequence it kind of really efficiently and get uh, like every time you pull a new read, it's like quite likely to be something that you haven't seen before. There was a question. Yes. Yeah, I was gonna ask, um, why is the uh, RNA um, I mean, it's kind of a hard thing in terms of molecular biology that you're doing because you're, there's like a bit of a needle in a haystack problem. So you're, even though you can synthesize oligos very efficiently and get huge, like molar, like amounts of them, um, you're still like trying to hold on to a ton of molecules and it's just hard to capture them all. So when you do the wash through, it's hard to like really hold on to all the ribosomal RNAs. Some of them kind of get washed through again. And the more they are there, the harder it is to really hold on to all of them. But a second round will usually solve that problem. So the second time through, now the ratio is like way down. Instead of being like 98 to 2%, in the second round, it's like more like 50, 50%. So you have like, it makes it much easier to, to get the last few of them. And you always have, it's never perfect, even with two rounds, you're still, if you want to sequence ribosomal RNAs, you'll get those no matter what you do, um, because there's just, they're so abundant, yeah. Any other questions on any of the, like, library construction, data generation stuff that we've talked about to this point? Yes. Mitochondrial RNA. Um, like, do you, how to get rid of them, or if you're interested in analyzing them? Hmm. Yeah, so they do come through and they do tend to be very abundant. I think for them, if you really are still finding that they're dominating your like counts too much, then you have to go to one of these. There are a number of like uh, products available now for library normalization that are keyed towards different like types of tissues that some of them will remove like uh, heme hemoglobin related RNAs, which is like people studying like blood conditions sometimes have like oh, just tons and tons of these molecules. And I believe there are also mitochondrial ones that will like try to, but, and they use kind of a similar, well, they use different strategies. Actually, there are some that use like this kind of approach. That's like a hybrid capture. And they just, instead of using uh, oligos that match the ribosomal sequences, they match other things. It could be anything, anything that you think is too abundant that you're trying to get rid of. Um, but they're also now CRISPR based um, deletion enrichment strategies where you basically like uh, use targeted CRISPR to chew up things that are too abundant and to sort of like get rid of those things and then sort of bring everything else up, relatively speaking. In the analysis, can you remove them? Yes. Once you get to the analysis stage, you have total power to like, um, you could remove them or you can ignore them. 
um, and the, those can kind of be equivalent. Um, the uh, I think a lot of people will just like allow everything to come through and then just choose to ignore transcripts that were really abundant that they're not interested in. They generally don't cause a problem for the analysis as long as you're able to like run your computational workflow like in with the resources you have in a reasonable amount of time. What does some of these people say ambient RNA? What exactly? Ambient RNA, I think, is usually meant in the context of single cell yeah. RNA. Um, so the distinction about with single cell RNA, um, of course, is that you're sequencing single cells. <laughs> um, and there's a kind of assumption that like you form a droplet of oil or whatever. And it's the RNA that's in that droplet came from the cell that was in the droplet that then was exploded and produced a kind of, you make a cDNA library inside of that cell in, in essence. Um, but the these uh, droplets are kind of all in a solution and you can have cells that were had already broken apart where there's just RNA everywhere. And that RNA just kind of gets into these droplets that, and it isn't from a cell that was inside the droplet. It's from just the soup. Uh, and they call that our ambient RNA. Um, in a bulk RNA seq experiment, essentially what where you sequence all of the sequence is ambient RNA. Because the very first thing you do is like break open every single cell. It all gets mixed together. And that has the advantage that you can have, you know, cells, you know, in a mouse in a mouse or in the freezer or tissue culture. And then you can directly go to a state where you have RNA molecules that are protected from degradation. So it's like you can make a very robust like sample like quite easily, um, but it's bulk like right from the first step it's like everything's in a big pile and you're you have to like pull things out of the pile and try to figure out like how they corresponded to different cells. What about the RNA inside the RNA in. So you're interested in RNAs that are in like extracellular where is it of like, I think in the bulk RNA seq experiments they you can profile them because you're not the way the RNA is isolated should shouldn't remove them right like every cell is broken open but RNAs that were outside the cell are still there too so the bulk RNA seq experiment should be able to like detect them. Single cell exosome analysis. I'm not sure if that's uh, for the bulk. You know, just uh, for the exosome exosome RNA, you know, uh, just they grab uh, whatever they have in the you know the uh, cell media, and they try to you know uh, extract and you know, continue the process. Like, so yeah, if like you want to enrich for them specifically, then I guess that would be an earlier step where you try to actually separate your cells from the non-cellular RNA. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could either, they could either be part of the bulk or you could try to separate them. And I think either path should feed into this kind of library construction like relatively well. Um, any other, yes? Do any of these options really Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, a little bit. I mean, if you do an exome capture that adds a pretty good chunk of cost because you have to pay for an aliquot of the exome reagent and you have to pay for an exome capture step, which takes time and technician labor. Um, but then the sequencing is slightly more efficient, so you could produce a little bit less sequence data, but overall it still costs you more because at this point the sequence, the per base sequence cost has become so low that uh, in many cases it's the like the library manipulation costs can actually dominate your your costs. Um, so that is something you wouldn't do if lightly. Um, I think if you're trying to maximize the number of samples you can process, uh, so you just want as many replicates or as many conditions, as many like critters or plants or whatever it is as possible. In that scenario, I would recommend probably going with the ribo reduction um, because you have to do something um, to reduce the amount of ribosomal RNAs and then go straight into bulk RNA-seq library construction and then sequencing at a relatively low depth where your emphasis is more on sample count than it is on depth of individual libraries. 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, long story short, the answer is yes, but not huge amounts. It's like an extra couple hundred dollars here or, or, or not. Um, this is just a depiction, a visual depiction of the strand information um, that I talked through showing that, you know, sometimes you have libraries where you align your reads and the red and blue indicate the strand. Um, and there's just kind of a random mix of the strands and you can't really tell, you're not being told what strand the RNA was transcribed from. Um, and then the bottom is like where you have the strand information encoded in the data in some way. And we're going to show an example in IGB of what it looks like uh, during the hands-on part. Um, replicates, um, technical replicates is not something people do. Like you don't need to worry about like two runs of the, the instrument being different or two different flow cells or lanes. Once you have a library constructed, you're probably even mostly okay to sequence some of your samples at one core and then later some of them get sequenced at another core as long as the sequencing parameters are the same like sequence read length and things even that is probably fine um but biological replicates of course in biology you need replicates so rna seq does not make that go away um there's a lot of different types of analysis you can do with rna seq and some of these questions that you want to answer ask might be might influence how deeply you sequence um, so if you're just interested in gene and differential expression, which is what we're going to focus mostly in this course, you can get away with relatively sparse sequencing of each sample. Um, and you may get better like value out of doing you know, in your statistics from doing more samples at a shallower depth than doing a few samples at a deep depth. But then if you're doing other things like alternative expression analysis, if you're trying to discover new transcripts, allele specific expression, detecting uh, mutations or, or fusions or studying RNA editing, all of those things will require you to sequence your library like more comprehensively. Um, as I said, there's some themes of, of RNA-seq workflows. They generally follow this pattern. You obtain your RNA data, you align or assemble the reads, you then have an alignment file that then feeds into a lot of different downstream tools, which all take the same alignment file, but ask different questions of the alignments for different uh, purposes. Uh, and then you wind up with some but that tool will output some uh, often almost incoherent, hard to understand, crazy custom formatted output files that you then feed into some kind of post-processing to visualize, understand, sort of check sanity um, and produce uh, figures. Uh, and then you get to the point where you're really trying to synthesize and, and make a, uh, an interpretation from the data. Um, this is from a review in 2019, so it's a little bit dated, but still pretty accurate, um, showing some example workflows. So these are some of the really popular RNA-seq workflows, and we're going to go through several of, uh, of these in, in detail, uh, kind of doing a, a, a reference genome-based approach and a reference-free approach, and then some different like uh, sort of branches within the, the reference genome-based approach. Uh, and then the final slide I had was this, we've already talked a little bit about this, this the idea of the difference between bulk and single cell. So some of you are here because you're primarily interested in single cell RNA sequencing, some primarily bulk, some both. Um, I would say that these things are really quite different still. So um, there are experiments where the single cell brings a lot of value, but I would not say that single cell RNA sequencing has kind of displaced bulk RNA sequencing, that it's somehow like the same thing, but now you know everything about individual cells. They're actually like very different um, in what you get. Um, so uh, in a bunch of different ways, one way is cost. Single cell experiments are still very expensive because in order to produce a decent amount of data per cell, you just need a, a large amount of data total. The total number of cells, it's really important to, to think about this when you're interpreting these experiments. The total number of cells that you're profiling in a single cell experiment, something like 10,000, 15,000 if you're lucky, versus um, bulk RNA, they're on different planets. The bulk RNA seq could be millions or tens of millions, tens of millions of cells that were like making up the milieu that you isolated your RNA from versus 10,000. So they're like orders of magnitude different. Um, if you're interested in genes that are rarely expressed, you're just not going to see them at all in single cell. The single cell data you get from each cell is extremely sparse. It's like very, very patchy data. It's like this it's super, super patchy with tons of dropout, like overall picture of the transcriptome. Whereas the bulk RNA-seq, you don't know what's happening in individual cells, but you get a very, very high resolution image of that bulk uh, transcriptome. So I think there's a lot of cases where making it makes sense to do both. Um, this is just a reference slide, again, pointed to a supplementary table that has a whole bunch of like common questions with, with answers. Um, so that's just there for you to refer to. 
Um, and yeah, so that's it for the, the lecture. We're gonna transition now into really doing the hands-on content. Um, this is like a really high level overview of the, the pipeline that we're gonna walk through. We're gonna start with raw sequence data. We're going to align it, um, do a transcript compilation where we essentially sort of uh, assemble and estimate the expression of individual transcripts. Uh, and then we're gonna feed the, those into down uh, differential expression um, pathway analysis visualization uh, modules. But before we get to that, we're really gonna study the sort of fundamentals of the input data files from a kind of bioinformatics perspective.